Yeah, thank you, Maria. <clears throat> Good afternoon from my side as well, and welcome to our conference call about the results of the first quarter 2016. I think I can keep it brief. We have published key numbers already last week, and you have seen our analyst presentation this morning, so um, all the details you will now get from Dieter. Thank you very much, Oliver, and also a warm uh, welcome and good afternoon uh, from my side. Um, I, I use the presentation as published uh, on our website this morning, uh, so I will start with our new strategic uh, introductory chart uh, based on all the targets we have set in our renewal agenda. Uh, of course, uh, a one quarter compared to a 12 quarter target is not meaningful in all categories, but I will highlight uh, the, the points. Clearly, with the high net income, we will talk uh, later about the EPS growth had a wonderful start into this uh, uh, 12 quarter average period. Uh, I, I would from the 32 not uh, conclude that we will beat our 5% target in 2018 by a huge margin, but I would say we are well on track and uh, stay ahead of the 5% target. The ROE, uh, similar effect, just Q1 effect. Uh, PNC combined ratio, we, we still have a, a gap to reaching the flat 94. I will talk about it uh, with the PNC segment. Our life and health uh, OEs with a, a return on equity above 10%. We have a, a big shift in the participants here compared to year end. The stable one is our German life business, which ended the year with 25% with ROE and started the year with 25% ROE, where the other uh, are really moving in and out. The US was in at year end, is now out France was not in, but it is now in, and Italy moved out, Benelux Lux moved in, and our German health business moved out because we had a fairly large booking uh, on, on increasing risk, risk reserves uh, for the health book, which will normalize over the quarters. So you see still a lot of volatility. Uh, with the two disclosed transactions uh, on Korea and Taiwan, which are not yet in the numbers because the transactions are not closed, but with the uh, closing uh, of, of the two transactions, certainly these are two, two countries which then permanently move out of the category below 10%. Uh, new business margin I will talk about later. Interest rate sensitivity um, down two points compared to year end and on the right track. And on PIMCO, I will, uh, on the cost income ratio, I will also talk later about. And the other measurements are actually not, not done on a quarterly basis. So here we just put left in our year end numbers. So there are probably more at memoriam and not giving a, a quarter view. So let's move now to the uh, usual numbers. The revenues down 6%, of which uh, a good 1% is FX. Uh, life is the driver for the reduction, and it is our wanted reduction in life, because we sell life not for volume, but for value, and we are up on new business value, and that is how we drive it, and also on the risk consumption of the new business, we are moving in the right direction. Later, you get more. PNC plus close to 3%. And uh, asset management uh, double digits down in revenues. Uh, we talk about it when we look at the asset management numbers. Operating profit, overall, I'm, I must say, I feel with close to 2.8 billion we are repeating the strong start of the year from last year. And personally, I like this year's first quarter result more than last year's first quarter result. And I, I tell you why. Because our life business last year had in Q1 a, a lot of 
one-off effects from high realized gains. Uh, we did last year a lot of changes in our asset uh, portfolio in the life segment uh, in, in last year's uh, run for the low yield environment. So therefore there was a lot of realization in it which did not repeat this year. And this year we booked also another uh, 82 million uh, loss recognition operationally in our Korean unit because also in Korea the 10-year the in interest rates almost dropped 50 base points in Q1 parallel to other currencies. So, and uh, therefore I, I think the quality of the result is really good. Asset management is uh, uh, following uh, the outflows in particular on the retail space over the previous quarters we see uh, 90 million less operating profit. And the corporate segment, well, has an, another effect from our uh, internal pension. Uh, I, I actually put it in writing already a year ago in our explanation for Q1 that there is a high chance that it repeats in uh, this year. And I can repeat this statement and say, and there is a high chance that it repeats again next year. Um, and then we have a, a, a positive effect here uh, from uh, some Korean interest rate hedging, which explains the plus 27 million. So overall, I think a, a really a good number, uh, pretty much uh, same, same level as the good start last year. And then let's move to the next page, page seven. And now we are approaching the, probably this big topic of capital and solvency. Sure, a low yield environment is the best friend for fixed income uh, price, asset prices. So shareholders equity at a new record with 67 billion. However, how is the economic picture for it? and that is the Solvency II uh, capitalization, which is down uh, 11 points uh, on, a, on market movements and four points opening adjustment on a change uh, the German regulator has done on a tax treatment in our life company. That is a little bit of a complicated story as everything in Solvency II uh, but also I, I have to apologize that I did not watch out more in February uh, that this could have an impact because uh, uh, it is a, a treatment of the unassigned policyholder surplus which is a pretext figure in, in German local statutory accounting and was also a pretext figure in all our models. So. Uh, the regulator said, no, in your model you have to use it as a post-tax figure and the, the tax is still unpaid. That means it is still a tax buffer in the local entity. With this change, uh, actually Bafin took pretty late in February, the consequence is that actually the local solvency ratio of our German life business went up because it gave more flexibility of this tax buffer in the overall modeling. However, the transferability of uh, uh, AFR from the life unit to the group changed in the aggregation formula and the group is losing four points, although we have still the money available and the OE solvencies are all higher than before. So, and that is not a decision on Allianz model, that is a decision for all German life companies, whether you use standard model or internal model, it is for all the same. So it is nothing special for us. But also I must say I, I was a bit surprised that something which is in each entity positive ends up as a negative group effect I had also to, uh, to swallow when I understood the calculation. So now moving uh, the, the sensitivities I don't need to explain. Uh, I, I think they are all easy to read. Let's move to the next page and explain more what happened operationally in, in with our Solvency II number during the quarter. 
Uh, let's start with the upper half of the chart, which shows the development of the AFR, the own funds. Uh, we have created a waterfall chart actually mimicking uh, the prior MCEV development, so splitting between operational developments, market developments, and special effects. So the first minus 1.7 billion is uh, the tax treatment I have just mentioned. So that are the, the four points we, we lost uh, uh, over midnight January 1. Uh, the second part of the waterfall are the operating earnings of the business in the quarter uh, under Solvency 2 assumptions. So the, the 2 billion in life is probably the number sticking out. The other numbers, asset management, uh, PNC, and also corporate segment are in, in the end pretty close to the IFRS operating earnings, and that is there are only small economic variation like the reserve discounting in, in PNC, which has tiny effects and you can uh, qualitatively for, forget these differences. So why is it two billion in life? There is, uh, and, and please note these are pretext numbers here, otherwise I couldn't compare it with operating profit. Um, so that means in life we have an, a normal expected uh, business contribution of around 900 million. We have an, another uh, 600 million coming from operating variants, no assumption changes. And the last point is a good half a billion uh, of value of new business pre-tax. And as we have aligned our value of new business calculation fully with the Solvency 2 rules. So you, you can take one, one euro for one euro, our disclosed uh, new business values, cross it up for taxes, and, and you can add it here in the operating earnings. So I hope that this in the long run makes the number, numbers easier to understand. So the next <coughs> column is the market impact. 5.8 billion down, you will say, well, that is a huge number uh, uh, and much more than we would have expected from your disclosed sensitivities. But please, there are two effects why the number is, looks bigger than it really is. First, it is a pre-tax number. So take, take out some 30% taxes. Uh, you, you can compare it more easily with the disclosed sensitivities. And the second point is, as we wanted to bring it as close to the MCEV, we have actually also uh, calculated the market impact on our U.S. life business, which is actually under equivalence, does not have a market impact, and you would see the, uh, the, the counter position under other. So therefore, here this 5.8 is, is probably too big uh, to estimate uh, the impact on our solvency two ratio. Then we accrue for the dividend, and with 2.2 billion euros of net income and a 50% rule, you start in the first quarter with a big number, 1.1 1, 1 billion uh, dividend accrual, so that is actually a good 3% of our solvency ratio. In particular, important when you compare it to our peers, who are not accrued during the year uh, for quarterly uh, dividends. And then other, as I just explained, is, is a correction uh, for taxes and equivalents. So then uh, in, uh, in the SCR, uh, there it is much simpler. I focus just on market impact. That is just swap rates 50 base points down in Euroland and also most um, Asian currencies, equity down 7% and credit spread no movement, then you get to the numbers here. Uh, management actions, we have actually uh, reduced the impact by 1.3 billion. So you can also say when you all wanted in Solvency 2 numbers, we had roughly 18 points uh, movement from the market overall. 
uh, also matching our disclosed sensitivities and we compensated roughly eight. So uh, that is uh, what you can see. And with this one, I would then move uh, to the next one. And please note, both transactions, Korea and Taiwan, are not included and in, are still included as ongoing uh, going concern businesses in our Solvency II calculation. We only take them out when the uh, transactions are closed and I'm expecting at the moment a positive impact from both transactions. So, after so much explanation to Solvency II, let's stick uh, to the Solvency II training. <laughs> page 11 is a page uh, we have stolen from an EOPA training program they gave in London uh, well, one or two months ago. So you find it also on the EOPA website if you want to compare the details yourself. So this is a standard euro valuation curve for every undertaking using Solvency II in Euroland. It has nothing to do with Allianz. It has nothing to do with internal models. It is the valuation curve. And the valuation curve is built up out of one year forward rates and then translated into the spot rate. When you start the first 20 years, the light green is the spot rate, which you could also calculate backwards uh, by using the one year forward rates and then you progress uh, year after year. So the blue line is then an artificial spot rate created out of the observed first 20 years and then using progressively on a year-by-year -year basis as a one-year forward rate, the 4.2%. And the formulas down there explain in detail how it is being calculated, but it clearly shows that even in year 60, we are as undertakings using Solvency II far away from using 4.2% as a discounting rate. So then there is a the whole debate about, oh, what happens when the UFR is being reduced? We have disclosed on the comment page what is the impact for Allianz now. The proposal of EOPA is uh, Two, twofold. On one hand, they feel the 3.7% uh, would be more justified. And then they suggest that in, in a year, the movement should not be more than 20 base points. So if we would allow for the 50 base point reduction of the UFR, that would cost us 5% pitch points in our solvency two ratio. And that five percentage points would be, according to the EOPA proposal, then being achieved somewhere in 2019. So that is the EOPA proposal. Personally, I think that the 4.2 is still the justified rate, and the political debate will then go backward and forward between the EOPA proposal and the existing 4.2%. Why do I feel that the 4.2% is justified? Because it is the 2% inflation assumption set by Draghi and the EZB. And secondly, uh, we feel that when you look long term, the long term real rate is 2.2. EOPA has now reduced the period they are looking at. Therefore, they came to this calculation 50 base points lower. And certainly on a 60-year outlook, you can have a, a lot of arguments what is the right number. Actually, we, I recently saw a chart from the Bank of England interest rates showing the last three, three centuries. And then probably the good 2% is a better long-term real rate. Okay, so now enough of solvency two. Let's go back to our quarterly results. Uh, PNC, uh, pretty pleased with the volume growth, the 2.7% internal growth, 1% price, 2% uh, 
is actually a, a vol um, volume effect and probably you want to know uh, how the price effects are, where they are coming from. A very good start into the year by Germany, close to 2%. Also France, a uh, good 1.5%. And then in particular, uh, important to mention, UK, strong 3.5%. And Spain, uh, 5% uh, price effects. And then we had small negatives in Italy uh, and in the global corporate, so large corporate business, uh, and also a little bit in uh, credit insurance, Australia was more or less flat. So from this one, let's move to the results in, uh, in PNC, page 15. Uh, operating profit, good 150 million up, and actually the, the biggest driver for, for the difference is uh, the underwriting result, and the underwriting result benefited a lot from low catastrophe development. Actually, we had in the quarter some 20 million uh, CAT events. I, I'm not sure that you can call 20 million a CAT event, uh, so it, is, it was CAT-free the quarter. Uh, the accident here loss ratio worsened like on like maybe 50 base points, the attritional over last year. Uh, there is on one hand more mid-size losses where we had last year really nothing. So therefore, I, I would say it is normal quarterly volatility or as an interesting anecdote, our uh, AWP business, all our travel and assistance business had actually a, a worsening uh, due to the Zika virus because we had a lot of uh, travel cancellation which visibly increased uh, in, in this field uh, the loss ratio. So it's not only happening in Brazil, you can also see it in Munich. Uh, under other, the plus 113 million we had last year a big restructuring charge under this line for a fireman's fund. Uh, certainly that has not been repeated. That, is, that explains 90 million difference and the other 20 million is actually good news because we are increasing our fee income business uh, not only in uh, our assistance business but in particular in AGCS and Euler Hermes so that is another 20 million of sustainable profit. Uh, investments uh, substantially down 100 million from last year. I come to it in a second. Run-off results, uneventful, good contribution across the board, no, uh, no negative, so that means no reserve strengthenings in a few areas, some single-digit million uh, amounts, but that, that is not relevant. And I would also like to mention here that we are actively managing our runoff business uh, with uh, the deal with Ensta. Uh, we, we transferred 1.2 billion of long-term liability, liabilities which in the past years always gave uh, rise to uh, to increase reserves, so that volatility is out of the books. Uh, and then we have also sold our uh, UK asbestosis business, which was uh, written many decades ago by AGF. And that transaction is going to close probably in Q2. And then we have another uh, offload of uh, long tail liabilities, which help actually uh, to, to reduce also the capital charges for the long tail liabilities and will stabilize our runoff ratio, which I feel is anyway one of the strengths of our group. So then going to uh, uh, the flagship OEs overall, I think uh, excellent results. Now our, our leader in un underwriting profit by distance, Germany, strong 89 combined ratio, but also be benefiting from a really, really 
a pleasant uh, winter, uh, not so for the skiers, but for everybody else and in particular the insurers. Uh, so that was a good start into the year. Uh, Italy still a very strong uh, combined ratio even when we have uh, to accept that in motor the market is slightly uh, going worse. And you can also see that in other areas the business is really looking good. Allianz Worldwide Partners, I explained already, on one hand the Zika virus driving the, the loss ratio up. On the other hand, uh, we had also in our health business a, a worsening loss ratio. I think all others look pretty good. Australia 101, that is certainly not our 94% target, but please keep in mind that the first quarter in Australia is the quarter with the high uh, natural catastrophes uh, because it is uh, the, the autumn season, so to speak. And we, are, we think that 101 is a good start into the year also visible that it is 2% better than last year and when it continues like this then we end up also 2% better for the full year. And Latin America is not yet turning although in Brazil the, the group health business which was our most difficult area uh, had a positive uh, underwriting result uh, but motor business in the market uh, turned negative and then drove up further and further we had also more uh, I think a little bit of additional reserving and write downs for our Argentinian business. Spain uh, clearly uh, the, the fantastic development in volume strong combined ratio and with the price increases that's really a, a very nice business to watch. Interest income in PNC, page 19, I said already 100 million euros less. Um, uh, the, the big shift is, is actually in, in net harvesting and, and other. We had last year in Q1 a positive impact uh, from, uh, from FX and this year a negative. So the swing is uh, 60 million. So actually uh, as I'm also hoping that this is not repeating another factor that the sustainable profit uh, should actually be a, a bit higher. So and then I think the tables on, on current yield reinvestment you can uh, read yourself and then we move to the life bit. Let's start also with an update and I believe upgrade of our analyst presentation. Uh, a a chart which explains you, uh, I hope better, what is really our life strategy and how we are doing there. We, we are splitting our new business into four categories. Guaranteed savings and annuities is all the old stuff, if you want to say so. Uh, these are the long-term guarantee businesses. Then comes the capital efficient products. These are what we call the hybrids. That includes the fixed index annuity business we sell, of course, mainly in the U.S., but also very successfully in Germany. And then we have some uh, special capital efficient products in Germany, where actually in retail, in Germany itself, 89% of first quarter new business volume was in this category capital efficient products. That is a huge swing and a huge achievement of our uh, complex distribution channels and the management team here is really doing a fantastic job to adjust uh, to, to the low yield environment. Next category is unit linked without guarantees, so that is plain uh, mutual funds including a, a wrapped into an insurance product and then you have all the in risk products, in protect mortality, health, disability, etc. So you, you, you can really see uh, how we drive the volume mix, but also what does it mean for the new business margin. 
I believe we are pretty much on track to achieve our 3% new business margin. Uh, the, the missing part is that actually protection and health was weaker than expected in the first quarter and the weak part is coming from France, which you will also see in the uh, country figures of France, where we renewed our group, group health and disability protection business and the market was uh, too soft to get the price increases we wanted and hence we ended up with a slightly n a negative new business margin on this book. So there is um, more to fight for an improvement next year. But the renewal of this book is almost all in Q1, so therefore the next three quarters will not have this effect. So is this a relevant effect? Yes, it did cost us 40 base points in the Q1 new business margin for the whole segment. And then uh, I think the right-hand side of the chart is for you, for you good to read. You can in particular see that the U.S. had a fantastic quarter with its fixed index annuity business. Uh, we, we sold $2.8 billion, a 20% increase over last year, and actually also at a new business margin, which was uh, above 4%, so really a, a very good start uh, into the year. So now the operating profit in life. Um, as as I said in, in the beginning, um, the investment margin uh, is, is lower than last year because we did uh, less on uh, realized gains, but also uh, uh, the Korean impact is, is booked partially here. We had in the technical margin uh, a reduction in the profit because we had to strengthen uh, reserves in the U.S. and also, as I mentioned already earlier, uh, this uh, one-off addition uh, in our German health business. So also the sustainable number I would see uh, better than the 270 million we show as a positive technical margin. I think there is it should be clearly above 300 and a quarter. So another uh, point I have forgotten to mention in the quality evaluation of, of the quarter. So uh, then I would move on uh, to new business value. Uh, clearly compared to last year, 37% uh, uh, up in value of new business. So the, all the effort to write new business for value are really paying off. And I believe that the, the interest rate development is pretty comparable uh, Q116 over Q115. Uh, we, we, we lost, we dropped 50 base points. That is, uh, seems to be the Q1 story. Let's see how it works next year. Uh, although I, I'm this year less optimistic that we will see a recovery of interest rates over the summer as we saw it last year. Uh, so we have to make our 3% new business margin uh, in this environment uh, when we use uh, quarter-end uh, interest rates, uh, the new business margin would drop some 50 base points. So what is then my expectation for the second quarter? As I said, that 50 base points will be roughly compensated uh, by, by the French group life group protection business. So uh, I would expect that uh, in the second quarter we should be somewhere uh, around the 2.5 percent. And as we have more measurements and activities planned, I, I believe even in the low yield environment we can make our 3 percent uh, step by step over the next quarters. So as I, I mentioned uh, already to highlight a few strong figures, Germany above 3%, and I believe we will see even here an uplift in new business margin over time. 
uh, U.S. with 3.5 percent probably uh, at at the maximum what they can do. In Italy, I would uh, look for an improvement, and also in France, Asia Pacific will certainly benefit uh, from the disposals. For example, Korea had a new business margin of minus 0.6 in Q1. Uh, so. Uh, that looks to me all pretty much on track in the direction we should go. Page 27 is our uh, usual uh, due diligence page on can we still pay our guarantees and uh, is any guarantee a huge risk for us. I think in the meantime you should get used to this chart and I can only confirm that actually we are still far ahead of our guarantees and therefore we we are in safe territory. The details I leave to you for reading. Then we have more time for the discussion. Now coming to asset management. Uh, AUM sl slightly lower than year end. Actually two drivers for it. That is actually uh, the dollar is weakening again and uh, Allianz Global Investors heavily uh, had invested into active equity uh, suffered with the equity market. Otherwise, I think actually PIMCO standalone and dollar showed a small plus in assets under management between end of the year and end of the quarter. Um, but as we are a euro company and last year benefited from the dollar, so I'm not complaining that uh, this quarter the dollar went in the other direction. Um, so that are the, the biggest points. We had inflows in Allianz Global Investors in Q1 of a billion. Uh, PIMCO continued with 10 billion outflows uh, very much in the first month of the quarter, uh, but still uh, showing a level which is very comparable what you see with our asset management peers in, in the industry in active fixed income. The inflows are going to, to passive. And I would still expect that uh, PIMCO, as I said before, and very consistent, the second half of the year uh, we, we are looking for a, a positive inflow number in total. However, with the, the outflows and in particular the accumulated outflows now over four quarters compared to last year, it's no surprise that I'm now on page 31 that the revenues are, are dropping by 12%. Actually, uh, when you look at PIM, PIMCO standalone, uh, we are more than, we are actually 15% down in revenues and Allianz Global Investors, well, 7% decline in the stock market translates roughly into a 7% decline in, in fees. So that is not a surprise, but we have also done here one correction. You, you see the big drop in the fee margin uh, at Allianz Global Investors. Uh, we, we found that we have done for years one position of uh, ad, advisory fees, always shown as uh, uh, assets under management related. As they were not, we kept them for the P&L, but we are not showing them anymore in this KPI here. So actually, the, the drop of the number uh, would be much sm smaller. I think out of the 3.6 base points in drop you see here, it's about uh, a good two and a half base points are linked to this change in accounting and one base point is a uh, mixed change of underlying uh, funds. So that translates then into a profit and loss statement of our asset management business dropping 16% in euros from 550 to 460. Performance fees are pretty much at the same level as last year. 
and the big drivers are volume and margin uh, where the compensating effect you should have seen un under other but then it is I think uh, consumed uh, by, by other uh, developments. So uh, performance fee at PIMCO is all coming from uh, this closed end fund we continue uh, to pay, pay back to the customers and we will see more of this performance fees there and performance fees of the ongoing funds there was actually not a lot uh, to book in Q1 and we continue to book the incentive plan for PIMCO under expenses so also there there will be a recovery uh, in, in the second half of the year which should then also help uh, the cost income ratio. And with this one I come already to the end of the story. Uh, corporate segment uh, similar uh, numbers as uh, last year operating loss of just uh, 74 million. And then I, I would uh, go from operating profit to net income. We had uh, quite uh, a large volume of uh, realized gains in Q1. Quite a bit of it was a forward sale we did uh, in, in April last year uh, selling uh, one of our strategic holdings in China at a good market and uh, the, the accounting uh, was with the completion of the transaction uh, in, in February or March. And then we sold also a beginning of the year uh, some equity held here at the center and also some fixed income uh, to uh, change the asset allocation to our own pension liabilities for the German business which we are here having here at the holding company and that created in total 568 million profits where the part which came from equity that was 400 something was according to the normal tax rules tax free and that results then nicely in a tax rate of 24. So but let me also pour some water into the wine. Um, we, the, when the transaction with uh, Korea will close, we are expecting roughly a 350 million IFRS loss. That would be then also a non-operating item. And unfortunately, as this is also a, a, a realized loss on shares, it is as tax-free as the gains were in the first quarter. Therefore, the 350 million will then flow through uh, pre-tax, post-tax through our net income. Even taking this into account, I think we had a, a very uh, strong start for the year in our net income operating profit and also in the business we are writing for value in PNC and life and hence we keep our outlook unchanged. I think it would be too early uh, to move away from the outlook figure but having said that strong start into the year and now I'm happy to listen to your questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question at this time please press the star or asterisk key followed by the digit 1 on your telephone. Please ensure that the mute function on your telephone is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. If you find that your question has already been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star 2. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. We will pause for just a moment to allow everyone to signal. We will now take our first question from Peter Elliott from Kepler Chevio. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have three questions, please. Um, the first one was uh, was on slide 11. Um, thank you, uh, Dieter, very much for the, for the teaching there. Um, I guess you make this point yourself on the slide. 
Um, but it seems to me that the industry is currently getting quite a big benefit from the shape of the, uh, the curve, the gray curve, at 20 years. Um, and it, it seems quite strange that it's so sensitive to what happens around sort of years 18, 19, 20. So, you know, if the, if the forward rate of 18, 19 years increases, then the valuation curve will fall and your solvency ratio will fall. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly how the extrapolation formula works, but, you know, if, if you get sort of 18, 19 years going up a, a fair bit and the curve sloping down, then it, it's quite easy to see that the sort of the, the gray curve could be even sort of 200 basis points lower, um, sort of around sort of 25, 30. Um, so I'm just, that, that seems very counterintuitive to me, and I'm just wondering if you agree with that and, and if you have a, a view on that. Uh, second one, much quicker. Um, just given the recent disposals, I was wondering if you could give us an update on the current balance of your M&A budget. Um, and then the third one, um, inevitably, thank you very much for your disclosure on slide nine. Um, uh, and inevitably, we, need to, we always ask for more information when we get this useful stuff. Um, I just want to check a couple of assumptions. Um, I assume that the operating earnings uh, numbers are based on start of quarter assumptions, um, and I assume that the new business contribution is uh, an all-in number. So, you know, there's no additional negative pressures anywhere else from sort of growing the business at all. Um, and lastly, the 0.6 billion number you mentioned, mentioned for operating assumption changes. Uh, could you just say to what extent you consider that number to be repeatable? Thank you. I'm sorry for the okay. uh, question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Peter. So. So next time I only do the Solvency 2 charts and the rest we skip. Um, so on, on the swap curve, I'm, I'm not really following you because the valuation curve is the spot rate. So what we observe is the green line in the market. We have plotted the gray line because these are the one-year forward rates so you can, if you want, reconstruct the green line by starting somewhere in, in, in year two, and then you, you do on a pro rata uh, this one year forward rate to construct the spot rate. But yeah. the spot rate is in the end the spot rate, and whether uh, the two curves absolutely <coughs> follow the formula we have added to the page, I'm not sure. But yeah, actually... I, yeah. um, when I look at the gray curve, you can also say we have, yes, it is very steep in, in the years uh, uh, from 6 to, to 15, but this dip uh, between 14 and 20, you can also say that is not natural. So actually our valuation and the spot rate is actually too low at the moment. And, and actually we see that we have a very artificial market on this one. So you mm. can also make this point. I I'm, I'm cannot conclude your conclusion. Okay. Could I just quickly uh, explain what I was meaning there? Um, because I, I, I take your points completely. But my interpretation is that the blue part of the curve is basically calculated from the, the green curve at, at 20 years uh, and uh, a combination of the green curve and the gray curve. And the reason... No, 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 no. It, it's no. the green curve and then you, you add every year this one divided by 60 of the 4.2%. That is the formula which, which is being shown here. Okay. Uh, perhaps I'll follow up offline with the IR. Yeah, maybe uh, I think we, that is probably for a longer discussion and would be good for a seminar, yeah. Uh, so let's well, actually, look at the valuation rate 21. We have actually put the formula in how you move from 20 to 21. Yes, and the 2.2% in that formula is taken from the green, the gray curve, and you know it's quite a bit higher than the 20-year point because the curve is steep before 20 years, and so you've you know it rises quite sharply after 20 years because of the. Yeah, I think growth. we take it off. Otherwise, we are doing the yeah. rest of the day. Uh, this one here. Disposals, uh, I, I think we only update uh, in uh, the published M&A budget when the transactions are closed. I'm not doing now rough, rough estimates. Uh, 
uh, but with, with the numbers I have given, you can do your own uh, roll forward. And the last one, the operating earnings. Uh, no, there is no uh, averaging effect in it because we did not use any assumption changes. And uh, the, of the operating variance, uh, maybe 400 million is special, 200 million is more normal. So that means if you want to normalize the 2 billion, uh, assuming that the pre-tax new business value is unchanged, then we are somewhere at uh, 1.6 billion plus for a quart. Okay, thanks a lot. We will now take our next question from James Shuck from UBS. Please go ahead, your line is open. Um, good afternoon, Dieter. Um, I also had three questions, please. Um, just starting or um, well, returning to slide nine. Um, thanks again for the, uh, the the reconciliation between the uh, between the two ratios. I, I just wanted to sort of check my understanding of this because clearly the operating solvency two earnings are are flattered somewhat. But if you normalize for the good luck you had in the first quarter um, and the operating variance of of the six hundred. And then express that in relation, you annualize it and express it in relation to the SCR. I think you, you get a view that the organic capital generation in a, in a normal expected year would be in the region of 20 points um, of Solvency II um, uh, generation. So uh, can you just confirm that that number makes sense or if there's anything else I, I should be thinking of? And um, in particular, if you're able to give me an insight into um, what the level of capital you have to put up um, against the life new business profit under Solvency II, I'd be very interested to to, to understand that, please. Um, my second point um, is, is is a little bit tricky, but I I, I I just wanted to understand the profit signature um, under IFRS from um, the U.S. and the Italian um, business in particular, because clearly you've been growing um, very strongly in in both those those regions in, li in life and health. This is, um, and yet the um, operating profit in Q1 in the U.S. and in Italy, didn't really, they both fell. And um, I understand the U.S. Um, reflected a reserve increase of, of about 42 million. But um, it, am I right in thinking that um, there is an element of, of profit that's booked up front, um, reflecting the very strong growth, and that um, you know, if new business profit starts to decline, then there is going to be headwinds on the life and health earnings in the U.S. Um, and in Italy. I.e., um, there, are, there won't be a kind of averaging Im impact from the assets under management. If new business falls, then that will act as a big headwind from, from those two divisions. Um, and then thirdly, just very quickly, um, I wonder if you could just comment on how you see the M&A market evolving, um, particularly in the kind of 5 billion to, uh, to 10 billion um, euro sort of range in terms of opportunities and, and, um, and, and financial returns. Thank you. Okay. That's a very complex uh, list of questions. Okay, let, let me start with the uh, Solvency 2 generation. Uh, we, we show on the chart 9% pre-tax uh, for the quarter. So that would be six points after tax. So now when you say, okay, uh, one to one and a half points coming from this uh, one-off operational uh, gains, then you are more between 4.5 to 5% generation for the quarter, minus 3% uh, go into the, the dividend, then you are net off, uh, well, and now we can argue, yeah, it is may maybe 10, 10 points for the year net, but important is that it is a positive number because that is not including any changes we do via disposals and other capital management actions. And I think that is a, a very strong message, and I'm very happy that you are picking up on it, James, that we are generating uh, more solvency than, than we are consuming, and we will certainly explore on this point more uh, in, into the future. So second question, uh, operating profits, U.S. and Italy. In Italy, I, we just uh, didn't have the, the one-off uh, uh, performance fees we collected on, under the unit link business uh, last year. 
uh, the stock market was not not really strong. That is the biggest effect on the Italian operating profits. Therefore, it declined. Um, and then in the U.S., uh, the reserve strengthening was on an old block of business has nothing to do with our VA or fixed index annuity business. But also, I have to say, we had uh, some some negatives from the base risk in this very volatile. A stock market in Q1, so the old VA block uh, had some base risk losses, but th that has nothing to do with early booking and late booking. So I feel that the fixed index annuity business is a very stable source of operating profit and growing nicely with the volume of uh, funds under management. The last point is uh, the, the M&A market, five to ten billion. Well, I haven't seen a, a lot of these deals uh, uh, recently in the insurance space. It seems to be happening more outside the insurance space. So, therefore, I, I cannot say whether the pricing of this transaction is, is uh, better or worse. The, the data points are so rare that uh, no conclusion is possible. Okay, thank you very much, Dieter. We will now take our next question from Michael Hunter from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, the um, only solvency, uh, can, you give a, can you say how much benefit the um, announced disposals of Korea and Taiwan would bring? Um, on the um, asset management, you said with confidence that or oh, understood that um, the total net outflow this quarter would become a total net inflow by the year end, uh, and I just wondered if you can uh, you can maybe share some of your confidence with us. And then the final point is um, it, it, it's a question is um, the the booklets. I mean, there's lots of nice information, but they're getting thinner every every time you report. And clearly, that's a voluntary decision. Why do you think the market would reward less um, information? Thank you. Uh, okay, the last point is easy to answer. You probably uh, got asked by my IR colleagues that you should ask this question. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think um, that we are delivering already so many details and certainly Q1 and Q3 are not anymore accompanied by uh, financial statements, so therefore these are lighter quarters, but uh, most of our peers have given up on these quarters completely. Therefore, with our analyst presentation, we give really a very comprehensive view plus a qualitative explanation what has happened. And then you find on our website an additional spreadsheet where you can download a, a lot of additional details when when you want to have uh, more details. And altogether, I, I believe that is a, a pretty pretty good service uh, to to give enough data points for the development of Allianz. And then in Q2 and Q4, you have then the additional fin financial statements. Uh, the, the impact of the two Asian disposals is positive, but I'm not giving uh, an, any, any numbers. Let's first close the transaction, do the full calculation, and then we know it. And uh, the asset management confidence is reflecting the confidence of the PIMCO management team. And uh, I, I mirror it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. They have some... Uh, Good, good ideas and plans how to move it forward, but you also know that the asset management industry is a, a, a very confidential industry which is not disclosing uh, too early ideas and plans. Thank you very much. We will now take our next question from Paul Diet from RBC. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, hi there. Um, just a, a couple of questions on the life business from me. Um, firstly, on the on the US and the, the FIA 
business. Um, can you remind me, what's your views on the impact of the, the final DOL rules um, on that business? Because um, obviously the, the fixed index annuities uh, got brought into into scope within that. So do, does that sort of change your view on the, the outlook for that business at all? Um, that's question one. And then secondly, it was just on the change um, in product mix uh, that you've uh, been very successful in, in doing in the in the life business, um, you know, particularly um, in Germany. I think you said the um, huge huge proportion of new business that's going into capital efficient products now. Um, is there a is there a higher cost at the moment of uh, you know, marketing those new new style products, um, you know, and the the changing distribution costs, I guess, um, of that shift that further down the line we might see fall away and therefore the, the you know the VNB um, margin actually increases increases more into the future because of, of lower ongoing costs or uh, is, that, is that not something that's really big enough to register? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the, the question with the DOL rule is not easy to answer. So let let me offer you uh, two answers. Uh, f first answer is uh, there is still a, a review of this DOL rule before it is truly final. So the, the, the whole story about what is the final rule is, is not yet over and is still under discussion. It, it could happen that the fixed index annuity business is dropping off this list uh, again uh, because it, it was it came also in uh, at, at the last moment. For us ourselves, we see it actually even the current version of the role as an opportunity, as we have propo proprietary channels uh, which should help us uh, to to drive actually the volume and we feel that overall the fixed index annuity market will not get smaller. It, it actually could still grow with the, with the current version of the DOL rule and we see ourselves not as disadvantaged to participate in, in this market. So that is the, the two answers I can offer you. Um, very precise, in Germany we don't have higher costs included in this new business. Uh, however, you have a good point with your question. Uh, with the uh, uh, already announced reduction of the guarantee rate for traditional products from 1.25 to 90 base points from January 1 on, what is the suggestion of the German uh, uh, Treasury. Uh, so with this one, we believe that actually the customer interest in this new product continues to grow. Uh, actually, the, the traditional products with guarantees below 1% are probably even more difficult to sell. Uh, that means our own agents have no arguments uh, that, that other competitors offer different products which are easier to explain to the customer and uh, uh, the independent agents, so all the financial brokers, uh, are anyway uh, selling our products uh, very well and that will then continue to grow in market share overall. For us, we are, I think in Germany, our market position is, is really a, an excellent one. Excellent, thank you. We will now take our next question from Thomas Schiedel from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first question um, on capital management. So let's assume that for the rest of the year you stayed 186% because what you earn is basically consumed by capital markets and you would have, let's say, 3 billion M&A budget left by end of the year. Would you still feel comfortable, you know, 
paying this back to shareholders, which would result in a 9% drop from 186 to 177? Or would you like to be at a higher capital level in order to execute you know, this uh, capital return to shareholders? That's the first question. Second question, uh, asset management, uh, the revenue margin you know, is going down uh, quarter by quarter. 40.9 is now the level. Is this the new normal uh, in a way, or are we seeing further reductions on this important uh, metric? And the third question in PNC, I think if I load it for normal nut cut, you are more in the range of 96% combined ratio versus a target 94. Especially expenses are now trending uh, in the wrong direction. Um, so what are the actions uh, to get you to the 94%? Okay, thank you, Thomas, for the question. Uh, capital management, we, we manage the company in a range uh, 180 to 200% as announced and uh, explained at the Capital Market Day in November. Um, we think we, we have no reason to change any statements made at this Capital Market Day, also how we handle the M&A budget, either it's, uh, it's M&A or uh, we return it to the market. So uh, on asset management, uh, in its current mix, uh, the revenue margin uh, of this quarter is probably the best starting point for the upcoming quarters. Um, certainly, midterm, uh, we, we have clearly to, to work on it, and that will be considered as part of uh, a future uh, strategic plans of our two asset managers. On the PNC ratio, I'm, I'm not uh, fully ag agreeing with you. Uh, first of all, each quarter has a, a, a slightly different uh, base, baseline. Our, usually our full year runoff ratio is also better than the Q1 uh, runoff ratio. Uh, and as I said, we had in the attritional loss ratio some, uh, some volatility in Q1, uh, which went in the negative direction. So our, we had last year 94.5. I feel that we are still playing around this number as a, a combined ratio. But I said there is still a gap to the 94. So with this part, I clearly agree with you. Thomas. Okay, on the maybe one follow up first one. So let's assume 185 is the number in Q4. Would you then be willing to go to 175, assuming you, you return 3 billion to shareholders, or is that violating the 180 to 200 tolerance? That would violate the 180, but uh, don't, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dieter. We will now take our next question from Farouk Anis from Citigroup. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, hi there. Thank you very much. Um, just going back to capital generation, um, going also back to, to what, what James, um, James Shupp was saying earlier, um, in num numerical terms, you're ending up with a number, you know, post um, kind of business evolution, increase in SCR, you're ending up with something roughly about $7 billion a year. And that number is materially bigger than your previous guidance on free cash flow. Um, now, I know that free cash flow is not necessarily the same thing as solvency to capital generation, but I was wondering if you could just reconcile the two and which number you would um, recommend we use when we're trying to work out how much cash you're generating in the business and how much you're going to uh, possibly uh, be able to use um, going forward. So just to reconcile those numbers, you know, the $7 billion and the $5 billion that you've talked about historically. Um, also, going to uh, capital light products, when, when you look at the profit uh, under IFRS uh, as a percentage of reserves, it's, just, it's a very decent margin compared to the guaranteed product business, which is, I guess, not surprising. Um, what is the sort of average capital consumption um, of that business? Is it, is it a quarter? Is it a, a fifth of the guaranteed business, just, just roughly? 
Uh, and the last uh, question, actually, on AWP, um, to what extent do you think there's a bit of a, a repetitive um, potential continuation of, of poor combined ratio in that line? Because that's obviously been high growth, decent profitability. Just wondering to what extent we should worry that there's a, uh, a reduction in profitability for more than a quarter. Thank you. Um, let, let me start backwards with uh, AWP. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think that it is a, a, a long-term deterioration, um, but it, it might be still in, in Q2. Um, on, on the 7 billion number, uh, well, there is still some uh, uh, variation, and I said four, 400 million is, is still uh, it was still a one-off, so therefore you, you get a bit lower than 7 billion. And also, please, this is a pre-tax number when you want to make free cash flow out of it. Usually, the tax man wants his share. And uh, therefore, that that is then maybe a bit going uh, too far out of the life segment. But o overall, I think we are in, in, a, in a good way to manage our solvency to ratio go, going forward and still can pay an attractive uh, dividend. Uh, may, may I just return on that actually? So no, the 7 billion, uh, yeah, I, may, maybe I, I should have shared my back of the envelope calculation, but I mean, I'm, I'm taking tax off of that number. It still seems to me to be materially higher than, than your guidance on cash flow, but obviously you don't recognize that. Yes, but look, the guidance on cash flow was the real cash flow. Here you have still a, a, a solvency two calculation generating surplus, but whether you can distribute the surplus. Let, let's take a, a company who is only doing unit link business. You produce very stable and nice uh, value in force. And if the company has not a lot of capital and has high new business growth, then there is no cash to be distributed because uh, no supermarket, uh, even in the UK, will take value in force as a payment. And uh, therefore, you couldn't distribute the value in force, although it is generated surplus. So therefore, to translate from surplus Solvency to surplus generation to distributable cash in, in printed bills is still a, another step. Um, and then we had the capital consumption of the capital light business that varies very much uh, for each market. Uh, I, I can tell you my, my favorite example is Germany. Uh, our product perspective, which is one of our big, big sellers in the German retail space, has roughly 30% capital consumption, let's say for a single premium of 100,000 euros, compared to the uh, traditional product, which looked for the customer at first glance pretty similar. So that therefore in total maybe Half of the capital consumption is, is, is a, a fair assumption, but that will then show up over time in the business evolution number, because the business evolution number is the capital consumed by new business minus capital released by maturing business. Yes. Thank you very much. We will now take our next question from William Hawkins from KWBW. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully these two are quick. Um, these are the pension benefits that you said will probably recur in first quarter 17. Is that something that could recur in years after that as well, or is 2017 the last time it happens? Um, and then secondly, just conceptually, the, um, the M&A budget, the 1.2 billion magic figure, um, how is that affected when you do a disposal and when you do a disposal at a loss? Um, so things like Korea and Taiwan relevant for our thinking about that number, or do you just completely exclude them from, from the way you're thinking about the M&A budget? Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Will. Uh, the pension benefit is most likely to recur in 17. I, I think in 18 we will not see it. Uh, on the M&A budget, actually, I, I like the question. I have not thought about it that this would be a possibility that when we tell something at a loss that we could reduce the budget. Um, I have probably to ask uh, our shareholders what they would think about the idea, uh, but I pick up your your proposal and see whether we should subtract it. I suppose, sadly, I meant it would increase the budget, but um, uh, <laughs> either way, it, it, you're saying it's excluded from your thoughts about the budget. Uh, until five minutes ago, it was, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> We will now take our next question from Ferdico Salerno from Maine First Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, did there two questions, both on PNC for me, please. Uh, the first is on France. You have an excellent combined ratio there, still at 95, with the spread uh, uh, relative to the market getting wider if possible. Do you have a view uh, how much better it could get from, from here? Um, that's the first question. And the second is on Italian motor. Uh, some local players are mentioning less competition. Uh, do you have a view on this? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think also our French business uh, uh, has to contribute to the 94 group target and we are not giving uh, to anybody relief uh, to to participate in the 94 target. Uh, and as as a French business, when you look at the last quarters, is somewhere in between 94 flat and 96. So uh, with an average uh, just below 95. I think we are not so far off from this target, and I believe it is uh, certainly possible. On Italian motor, uh, it depends probably on your starting point, but we feel that uh, that the competition is still pretty strong. Okay, thank you. We will now take our next question from John Hawking from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, hi. Uh, good afternoon. I've got uh, three questions, please. Um, first, looking at the reinvestment yields, <coughs> um, both in sort of life and PNC, um, and as you look at sort of Q1 on Q1, uh, the gap between the actual reinvestment yield and the economic reinvestment yield has widened. So I think it was 10 points uh, last year in life and health. is now 20. It's 30 points now in PNC, and it was 20 bips. I just wonder whether that's a sign you're actually reaching for more um, or taking more risk to reach for yield in, in that business. What if you comment a little bit about how you see the risk of reinvestment? First question. Second question, um, <clears throat> looking at slide 21, where you've gone through the, um, the split of the new business by product bucket, um, I think it's a really helpful disclosure. I wonder what the earnings and the capital would look like if you split it on a similar basis. Uh, and then just finally, just, um, in, in the work you've done in terms of reducing the interest rate sensitivity of the um, capital base, uh, you know, what scope is there for you to lengthen the asset duration more, and what have you been doing in, in 2Q subsequent to the quarter end? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Let, let me start with uh, uh, reinvestment yield. Um, well, the, the disclosure, I, I actually, uh, I, I did not explain it uh, during my presentation. Um, what, what is under the economic reinvestment yield, we have just included here the, the costs of hedging foreign currency exposure. So it's mainly FX hedging. And uh, uh, therefore, I, I would not read in this that we are taking uh, more, more risk because with the, with the hedging, we bring the risk back to the previous level so you can only say that we have maybe taken more foreign currency uh, fixed income investments this year than last year, and therefore we have a, a bigger cost of, uh, of, of hedging. Uh, so 
the new no, business. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is this the issue then that you've actually you've you've proportionally invested more in, in foreign currency, or the cost of the hedging has gone up year on year? Uh, I I think it's more uh, volume driven and not cost of hedging. Okay, but thank you. I, um, but it is uh, probably decimal points, so uh, uh, t t tiny movements. Um, the, the return on capital for the individual buckets of new business, uh, that is a bit uh, similar to, uh, to Farouk's question on, on the uh, consumption, capital consumption of our capital efficient business. Uh, yes, we, we have to work on this uh, additional dis disclosure, uh, how, how the capital sent. We have at least disclosed on the previous page the operating profits uh, coming from the from these four buckets um, to, to give also the capital returns by buckets. Uh, we have to think about it. M might be an idea for our uh, when we do an, an end of the year more a full update on where we stand with our strategic agenda. Uh, that we could also include uh, something about it. And, uh, well, did, did this answer your question? Yes, I, and there's just a question about um, what more you can do from the ALM perspective to reduce the rates. Uh, yeah, the AL, uh, sorry, the AL, ALM part. Um, I, I think that uh, certainly a helpful step in, in closing the ALM gap are our two Asian disposals. Uh, and otherwise, we are continue to write uh, longer assets. Uh, we we have uh, uh, we had the opportunity in in the last uh, now uh, almost five months or four and a half months of the year really to participate in 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 sizable infrastructure debt placements of uh, sufficient duration. So we 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 certainly continue to write uh, very very long dated. Uh, bonds, uh, whether we should participate, as I was being asked this morning by the journalist, into the 55-year bond of Spain, which is being in place uh, during the days here. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure that we have 55-year-long liabilities we want to match with this bond. So, but. Um, that is a decision of our asset management guys whether they feel that we get enough margin out out of this bond. So just just to ask the follow up um, on the, <clears throat> so the, the the career and the Taiwan disposal. I can see that that's a perfectly sensible thing to do. But your your ROE target for the life entities so to get everything by to ten percent by the end of the target period. It, that is a very volatile metric. I just wondered whether there is actually underlying that as a more value-based metric. The actions you've taken to date seem to be based more on economic capital absorption rather than on gap equity. So is there actually um, an underlying metric as well as the ROE? Uh, yes, that, that, is, uh, that is on one hand true, but we will evaluate each of our entities whether they achieve a sustainable 10% ROE number. What we can only disclose here uh, in, in the numbers is the actual number without any adjustment. But in our internal judgment, when we look at it, uh, actually we, we look for a, a sustainable 10% ROE number. And when we get our new business mix driven through, when we make our uh, a new business margin at 3% with a smaller capital consumption for the, uh, our capital efficient products, uh, plus the fact that probably everybody will over the years also work <coughs> on their expenses. I, I believe that we can create also more sustainability in this number even if there are quarterly uh, jumps uh, backward and forward on, on realized gains and losses from investments. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Dieter. We will now take our next question from Michael Hayes from Commerce Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. 
Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Two questions. Um, can you shed a little bit more light on uh, the weather-related weather losses in the first quarter? To my understanding, you expect normalized 2.9% weather-related losses. Net cut was only 0.2%. How much was the, the, the weather-related uh, um, uh, losses, uh, and I understand that the definition of weather related is somewhat difficult. Second question, you mentioned um, a negative impact from German health on the operating profit. Can you uh, say what it was and uh, whether it is a kind of one, uh, one off effect in nature or whether it could be recurring? Uh, that was uh, just a strengthening of uh, loss reserves for health claims, that was a, a one-off effect. I, I, I must say it's probably even normalizing during the year. It is more a one-off for the quarter. It is probably a, more a nil effect for the year. So it is more a timing issue than a, a, a real uh, cost. Uh, whether, uh, well, actually, uh, that is weather related usually the first quarter is is below our global cat budget but the question always is what is cat and what is the weather uh, we we usually are, are actually not even uh, calculating uh, all weather losses because you you, you have uh, well slippery streets uh, and even if you have thousands of accidents because of ice and snow, you will never summarize it to a, a cat event, even if it was very costly. For us, a cat event is something which gets a number as an event and potentially ends up uh, being paid by the reinsurer. So uh, that is uh, the simple definition of a CAT event. We are collecting information to have the chance to get a reimbursement of the reinsurer. What is not reinsured, you, you, you never call a CAT event even if it was expensive. Uh, so therefore, it is a bit difficult to say what was what. Uh, in two CAT events, we just had 20 million in the year and weather related I would say we had one, one percentage point of, of the loss ratio was overall what came from, from weather. Um, in the second quarter, uh, certainly the industry will see uh, more cat events. The Canadian wildfire, which is uh, still uh, uh, devastating Alberta, is certainly creating a fairly sizable insurance event for the industry. We are not very big in Canada, so I don't think that it will hit uh, Allianz a lot, but it is a, a big industry event. Okay, thank you very much. So the, 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 the weather-related and plus net cut in, in the first quarter, one could say it, it, it was one, around 1.2 percent, and that compares uh, to uh, a normalized... One point, take 1.2 percent. Um, it's a, a and that compares to the 2.9% which you, on a normalized basis, expect for the whole year. Uh, yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. We will now take our next question from Nick Holmes from Society Generale. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, hi there. Thank you very much. Just uh, two questions. First is, coming back to your shift towards capital light life products, I wonder, Dita, whether you could say that the objective here is growth or capital efficiency and capital return. And then a uh, second question on Asia. You're exiting Korea, Taiwan. Do you see investment opportunities elsewhere? And if so, where would they be? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Nick, thank you for the question. Well, actually, uh, we believe that the capital efficient products <coughs> offer both growth and capital return because the construction of the products allows us actually uh, to run more attractive in investment portfolios for our customers. And hence, uh, 
the long-term customer return is improved compared to a traditional product where you are with the ALM and, and the low yield environment always for, almost forced to end up in fixed <coughs> income uh, only. So therefore we, we really see it as the right application for the industry. Selling just a wrapper around unit links <coughs> is not what an insurance company can focus on. Then you can, then the customer can go to an asset manager. Actually, we have a very good one and we can sell uh, our asset management mutual funds directly to the customer. So it is not covering the same need of the customer. Therefore, we are a strong believer that when the life insurance industry wants to have a, a right to exist and to cover uh, customer needs, you need more than unit linked. That is our philosophy. I know that the philosophy is not fully shared by others. And I also admit that we have also markets where we are relying still too much on unit linked uh, business. And I'm not against unit linked, but it is not good enough as a long term strategy. That is what I'm saying. And we will in the countries where we are currently too much dependent on unit linked certainly introduce also our capital efficient products and therefore in our disclosure we keeping it clearly separate from the unit link box because we see it as true long-term life insurance business and opportunities for our industry and not just saving capital uh, and, and shifting the, the investment risk to the customer. Uh, in uh, Asia, uh, yes, we so just a quick, a quick, a quick follow-up uh, to your comment there. Um, do you think that, therefore, that um, the growth prospects in life will actually be quite good from this shift to capital light? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Definitely. Otherwise, I, I, we should uh, change our strategy immediately because a company which doesn't grow dies. That's great. Thank you. And sorry, with Asia. Uh, with Asia. Uh, yeah, we, we are expanding our uh, bank distribution in Asia, in, in Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, you, you, well, uh, Korea was actually not anymore an Asian growth market. Korea is, is a, a matured market. Uh, therefore, when, when, you, when you buy and invest in businesses in Asia for high growth, then uh, Korea is probably <clears throat> not the place uh, where you would start. Uh, and uh, in Taiwan, we have not reduced our new business capabilities at all. We have sold a legacy book and we are not transferring any employee and our new business mach machine is completely intact and will continue to, to grow the business. Taiwan is a great place uh, for gathering and accumulate assets. We are, I think, also on the asset management side in combination between PIMCO and HEI, the, the largest foreign asset manager in the country with a, a very good market share and a, a very good growth perspective. So that is certainly a market we, we like a lot, and otherwise uh, the Southeast Asian places, we are growing our business. China is a, a longer discussion that would probably now go beyond uh, the time we have for the call. Um, but it w would it be correct to say that you do see uh, material investment opportunities in Asia? It is a territory that you're looking I, I would to say expand. good investment opportunities, the word material in context of a group which makes $120 billion revenue and $6 billion net income plus uh, is, uh, the word material is always a big word. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. It's already half past three, so I guess we have time for one last question, please, if there's any. 
Yes, we will now take our last question from Vinvest Malhortra from Medio Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, many thanks. Uh, thanks. I'll keep it really quick. Uh, just, you know, uh, in the PNC, so one on PNC, please, uh, and then one on Simco and one on Life, all quick ones. PNC, the attritional improvements that we used to talk about from the turnaround operations, uh, that slide was sort of not here because of this compact structure. But if you could comment on that just so that we see how the 94 and a half goes to 94, is, is there still a thinking from the operational side? Uh, uh, Vinit, you, you are really hard to understand somewhere that your line is broken in, breaking in oh, and out. Oh, it is, it is better. Yeah, yeah, maybe can you repeat your question? I couldn't get it. Of course, it. sorry. Uh, so on the PNC, the 94 and a half going to, towards 94. So in the past, there used to be a slide showing the three buckets of combined ratios, uh, and there was a focus also on the turnaround units. Uh, is there still that kind of focus, or is just because of the quarterly compression of slides that we haven't seen? Uh, you, you mean our chart with uh, various categories? Yeah. No, we we are still having the same focus, and uh, it is uh, and nothing has changed there. Uh, we will drive our business uh, the same way as before. Uh, I, I see you, you all make a strong point for the uh, additional appendix, which I, I really think we should, we are overloading you with, with information. Um, so it is an un unchanged uh, focus and uh, the units which are on, on the list um, <coughs> above 100, well, you can see it uh, easily, it's uh, Brazil and Argentina still stick out there um, and uh, are the, the main areas and at the moment AWP is also moved above 100 so uh, we have to, to watch out as some of you also observed that we have to see that it's getting uh, back on track uh, that are actually the, the main areas to focus on. Okay, and then you had another question on life? Asset management? Or asset management? Yes, sorry, on, on life, uh, uh, I'll take the asset management first. On PIMCO, when we track the monthly total return fund and the income and the PIMCO income fund flow data, for the quarter they seem to have netted out each other. And we keep reading about how various strategies are still attracting money. So where is this 10 billion outflow coming from? I, I know it's a very good number and the trend is positive, but I'm just quite curious. Where is this uh, really coming from? I, I think that's uh, m mainly uh, institutional who are adjusting their strategies in, in the environment. That has nothing to do with uh, uh, Pim PIMCO's uh, attitude. Uh, your observation on, on that the two big ones are netting out is fully correct. Can I ask? One more, please. The, uh, the, the French group life business, uh, what was the motivation to write when the market was weak and the pricing was not good? So just the growth you wanted? or uh, This is mainly a renewal of, of old, old business. Uh, well, we are following here the uh, the EUPA definition of uh, new and old. Um, so it's one-year contracts, therefore they show up every year as new business, uh, but probably most of these customers are with us the last two decades. Uh, so uh, uh, it is, we keep our, our market share in this market uh, and we, I, I still believe we can also in following years agree to, to better rates with the customer and have the opportunity to price up this business. Uh, otherwise, you are right. We should not continue all of these policies if we are not getting it to a pricing position where we want to have it. Right. Thank you very much. Then, thank you all. Yeah, for my side as well, thank you for joining the call. and. Um, we say goodbye for now and wish you all a very pleasant remaining afternoon. Bye.
that will conclude today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now disconnect.